Okay, so let's let's give uh, like a minute or two minutes because like I need to uh like you know like settle down a little bit. But Tracy, how are you today? I'm very well. How are you? How are you guys? Good, good, good. Wait, are you based in Hong Kong? Yes, I am. Where are you guys now? Um, I think all of us, Lisa and Mara, are from Hong Kong. Uh. Yeah, we're in Hong Kong. Well, I, I, I'm not at, where is this? Is this like Repulse Bay or something? <laughs> I just found a random picture in my gallery. <laughs> this is, uh, if, you, if you're from the Twin Peak, if you're coming down, you'll see this view. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's one of the hikes I did. I think it was. Yeah, man. Okay, so let's get started. Um, you ready? You guys ready? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, are you ready? Okay, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Okay, that's good then. Okay, so hey everyone, on behalf of Project Institute, thanks for being here. Like our job is to provide a platform to, grip, to bridge a gap in the real estate and property community, to share knowledge in both real estate and application and technology. So we're here today to learn tips from a branding professional like Tracy and teaching prop tech professional like ourselves how to build an authentic brand in the prop tech and real estate world. And then I want to start by introducing everyone first, uh, from Tracy to Amara, Fish, and Gary. Um, I'll, can you tell me more about yourself? Do I start? Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, Darren, you, you froze. Yeah. Cool. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Tracy. I'm based in Hong Kong and uh, born and raised here, actually. I run a firm now called Frame and Fame. We do branding for people. So what that means, I work with startup owners. Um, that is how I met Gary, actually. Uh, I was mentoring an accelerator program that Gary participated in. And then not only startups, but I work with managers, um, executives, and primarily who are, you know, have a senior seat in the boardroom. We need to make a speech, make a brand to command attention. I always say, you know, I help people to get enough or the attention and the pay they deserve. So this is what I do. And I, through, I, I help them through messaging and I coach them to communicate, uh, to revamp their brand message. Sometimes you also do brand image, like portraits. That is the lead magnet for us as a people, mm -hmm. then as a person, and then also uh, some tactics to improve the online presence. Oh, that's cool. Uh, Myra, like, uh, how about yourself? Hi, uh, yeah, Amira. Um, yeah. So I'm the lead pricing and deal desk manager at OIL. So my, uh, the main uh, things that I do is uh, determining the strategy of OIL. Uh, our portfolio is about 1,000 properties and counting. And we've, um, that's over 700,000 inventories. Um, so I also do various things really. It's um, a startup, so it's uh, high growth and there's a lot of changes. So we uh, work on a lot of projects as well. So existing product, pro like uh, our products and audits, for example, uh, for any of the properties that we have and also ensuring that we're boosting occupancies and looking at the positive EBITDA figures of each one of the P&Ls of the properties as well. I see. Yeah. Fish, uh, can, can you tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I started a company helping landlords manage their real estate portfolios here in Hong Kong. So we develop software to assist with the property management process um, from stuff <laughs> like managing payments, keeping, keeping track of payments, invoicing, uh, handling repairs, and contacting property agents. So. Um, we started with a, a platform to focus on smaller scale landlords and now we're more in the B2B space, targeting medium to large scale landlords here. I see. How about Gary, how about yourself? Hi, yeah, so uh, yeah, for our platform, uh, Real Inflow, we, we collect granular information on transactions and building information across Hong Kong and also Malaysia uh, at the moment. <laughs> So, um, yeah, I think the best way to describe our platform is creating the Bloomberg uh, for real estate information. I see. So my, myself is Darren. Uh, my company called Density is the real estate platform to allow you to find information, um, insights, and then product and services through experts directly. So our goal is to have a platform, just like TripAdvisor, that give people a third party and then understand that what experts can trust during overseas real estate investing. And today's more important thing is that for Project Institute, we call ourselves PTI, 
is that we really want to talk to a professional like Tracy here to learn more about you know ourselves. How can we have a message that a landlord will understand, or even for other people to understand what we do? Because real estate itself is a very complex uh, industry. And then when you add into tech into it, a lot of people will be like, "Oh, what's going on here?" And even a lot of time in the in the real estate sector, everyone's like, "What does that really means?" So. So it's, it's interesting to know how the brand professional will see, and then hopefully that we get something out of it, because for us, we really want to learn as a prop tech founders. So first of all, um, Tracy, um, would you mind telling me, uh, telling us more about why you do what you do? Because I'm sure there's a story behind it. <laughs> Speaking of story, is actually the reason or the answer why I start and what that is what I am doing. I, I love stories. So since I was a kid, I, I was just fascinated by stories and I love telling stories since ages ago. And then I started actually, um, when I started my career after school, I was a journalist um, and I did video journalism. Uh, you know, we capture images, video clips, and then, you know, with a script to tell people in a global audience, I was an associate press to tell them the story behind different cultures, politics, or economic environment. And then I moved on to PR, uh, corporate comms. And then when I was, you know, a few years ago, when I was in Singapore, I got to meet a lot of entrepreneurs in my uh, social communities. And then I recognized actually everybody has a purpose, has a story to start their own. And then I realized, why not I, I start a firm that help people instead of corporates to communicate their stories. So story is actually my story to start what I'm doing. Ah, oh, that's really cool. I think something that like, I'm sure we can all resonate with. And then, so uh, something that I'm really curious about, right, is that uh, what are the top like uh, three common mistakes that mm -hmm. real estate or prop tech professionals make when it comes to their brands and messages? Mm, it's a good question, Darren. I would say not even prop tech, but um, I got to work with a range of tech-based businesses. Specifically, now we work with startups. A lot of tech, you know, ad tech, prop tech, uh, compliance tech. And actually, when I start um, in my previous company, I did a lot of fintech as well. No matter what industry, as long as you add the tech elements into it, for some reasons, people love to complicate the issues. All right. Uh, they think that um, there are a lot of complex uh, solutions and then they are very keen. They're super passionate to tell about every little detail. But when you're too focused on the detail, you forget your big picture. Mm -hmm. So my job is to get people to understand things in a very simplified, consistent and clear way. Then you can have a very structured message to tell the audience. At the end of the day, I always say that uh, why communication is a, is a sort of global industry and we don't need to have a very localized strategy. Why? Because we communicate with people. At the end, it's a psychology thing. We only have, for example, eight seconds attention span, three minute story is enough, and an hour of speech, people only remember two minutes of it. So no matter how complicated your story you think you have, you still need to distill it, filter it, get the core of it, and have a gist to share. So to answer your question, the most common, I would say, problem or, you know, uh, things that people, or mistakes people commit in prop tech mm -hmm. industry is that they start from a lot of details. For example, they will say a lot of statistics, they will start from, uh, uh, the tech, the advancements that they have super passionate and they are passionate in that and then they start from it but they lost the connection with their with the audience which may not know the tech or the stats or the facts the businesses face right so they start from very simple thing I see yeah I think even when you're telling us like you're telling myself about those mistakes and in my head is instantly go into my first even not maybe even recently that i always make these mistakes and i'm just curious right so among because like, i'm sure you have a lot a lot of exposure in the tech world do you find that like uh prop tech itself because we were focusing on prop tech 
is there something that we tend to do more than other like tech business that when we pitch to people or talk to clients that you felt you felt is something that is like we gotta stop right now like what's something that you see uh-huh. I think uh, that re- for example that reminds me of my one of my conversation with Gary if you, see, if you still remember <laughs> uh, when I first got to know Gary my my question to him is you know of course what do you do and then but then I, I told him, you know what? I spent a day with you to understand what you do. Do you remember what we talked about mm-hmm. that, right? My messaging was then, like- That would be a problem because, because not many people can spend a day to understand how complicated <clears throat> your, your business is. And mm-hmm. in that case, because Gary mentioned, to, you know, in PropTech, there are many layers, not only the stat itself, not only the calculations, not the tech, but also how it connects with the complicated uh, or the, I would say, different issues in the property industry, right? From development to the structure, to selling, to the whole economic behind it. In that case, I would say the prop tech guys feel even, it's like their responsibility, that duty to throw everything to you in one place. But in, no matter what, remember, or speak up, your audience will only have two hands right if you throw them 10 balls at a time they can only catch two so no it's your choice to to select your materials I and see. Throw mm. that's really cool uh amira i want to spend some time because we just met today uh, would you mind tell us more also like similar to tracy what you do what what you do and then actually curious on how do you feel about what tracy said just now yeah um, so I think for me, my story as to why I do what I do maybe started like, uh, I think eight years ago when I started traveling and I actually started to realize that the bottle of Coke in each country, uh, determined how affordable the country was. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I looked into the uh, pricing strategy of Coke and I still think until today that that's one of the best pricing strategies they have out there. Um, because it really is a determinant of uh, how affordable a country is. So if you went to the UK, a bottle of uh, 1.5 liter Coke would be about one pound. If you go to, um, you know, Malaysia, a 500 ml would be one ringgit 50 cents. And if you go to Norway, one bottle of Coke would be approximately three pounds. So you can really tell already from there, like what, how the, um, you know, it, the pricing really affects um, you know, when it comes to different consumers in different countries. So I actually looked at where I wanted to go. And to me, it was more so that, you know, I, I looked at industries like travel, uh, industries like, uh, you know, the hospitality, mm-hmm. as well as, um, you know, like Lyft and Uber, those sort of like, you know, emerging startups, mainly because there's, a, uh, there's this term dynamic pricing, where, you know, the pricing strategies change. Um, a lot, whereas FMCGs are very much set. So I saw it more of a challenge, and that's how I started out in the um, in the pricing environment. And yeah, I'm I'm really keen on it as well. And properties similar, but very different as well. And no, no, in terms no, of no, yeah, sorry yeah, about that. Thank you. No, it was really close yeah. out. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so I'm curious too, right? Because like it just kind of remind me of like the Big Mac check, like the differences too. I think we're similar to Coke. You do it different places, and for you, so how do you find the difference? You know, compared to obviously F and B, and also for, for real estate, how do you think is different compared to uh, different industry? Yeah, I mean, we obviously have to see. You know, when we're talking about property, there is this uh, aspect of where property, as in, you know, is it somewhat like uh you know you're you're selling homes condominiums or or houses right or we're looking at the travel industries where you're selling rooms so if we're looking at something where it's uh, you know we're selling properties and 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 homes to people then i think like uh, we've seen that uh, there's an assumption surrounding pricing where there will never be a decrease in pricing unless there's something like the great depression right and then we're seeing something like um you know where uh hospitality and we haven't seen people, um, you know, look at uh, look at this sector because they always think it's doing really well. But with uh, you know the coronavirus, we've seen Marriott Hotel close so many of their chains as well. So you can see exactly how you know cash flow is a problem in the property, um, you know, sector when it comes to uh, tourism. And you know, a lot of them do not have that liquidity to be able to survive. 
And I think that's one of the main um, differences, I would say, you know, if you're talking about property and if we're comparing with FMCG, you know, beverages, for example, or Big Macs, that's something that, you know, it's a daily consumable item. So people, it, it's a lot more, um, you know, complex. It's a lot more simpler, I would say, than, you know, saying that, you know, you know, you know, when you were talking about economy you say there's like an exogenous hit where like you know like an asteroid comes you don't predict it and you don't have any sort of like uh, precipitation for the backlash but then for fmcg everyone needs to eat so there's not really like a huge hit it's just in terms of how long is the hit for but you know with um, you know beverages like coca-cola and big macs as well because their, their price point are a lot lower people do tend to go for them especially in the us uh, for like really fast food and cheap eats if you get what i mean i see no it's really cool because like, I, I i can see that so so back to like what tracy has suggested right about how people tend to throw a lot of things in one go to audiences do you feel the same and then actually curious too for yourself your real estate data professional and i'm sure so is gary and how do you feel when you tell people your work and then what is the, tr the trouble you have when you tell people the thing you do and then how you differentiate with each other do you find that as a, as a problem for you um yeah i would say you know i work in um tourism and a lot of the times you know because of my um my title, it's lead pricing and deal desk manager, it's quite a mouthful. And also to explain everything that I do, it's quite complicated, especially, you know, when you're talking to different industry professionals as well, you have to think about it and really condense it. And sometimes I, I just need, I, I always try to practice to have like two minutes to just like think, okay, what can I say? But sometimes you don't even have two minutes, you know? Sometimes like someone get, comes in the way and they like interrupt the conversation and then you're just like, oh, okay, I was just in the middle of my pitch, <laughs> you know? So it's not always possible. So I think what Tracy said, like trying to filter and trying to, you know, condense what you're thinking into one thing is, is really key, but it can also be really hard to do, especially when you're in, you, you're, you're affected by many, many environmental factors as well. Yeah. It's kind of cool. I was so curious. So, so Gary and Fish, do you guys have any thoughts on uh, like how, how do you guys feel about when you go to clients or telling people or VCs or other investors? So how do you feel about it when you pitch to them and how to describe your businesses? Uh, for Gary. myself? Oh, sorry. Go? Yeah, you go first. Sure. Um, I think for myself, it's like I get, I get quite frustrated because I have all these thoughts in my mind. And then all these things I want to say. And then I think it's also when you're doing like a kind of startup or something and you're doing so many tasks and, you know, one day I'm like so deep in the data and then another, and then suddenly I got to talk to an investor and like summarize what I'm doing, uh, you know, and then I'm talking about comparables and net effective rents and, you know, all these kind of terms. And then they're like, what are you talking about? Kind of, kind of thing. So it's like being able to switch, I think, you know, um, uh, your messaging uh, to who you're talking to and then also you know I think as Tracy said at the start it's uh, like last year when I was still you know when I just ended up Betatron I think my messaging was very long very complex uh, but we did quite a lot of work to shorten that down just so that we can summarize it in you know a few sentences but I think that's still a challenge still a challenge for me yeah that's cool is there something that Tracy taught you specifically that you remember that really helps you a lot compared to other advice that she has uh, I think she just made, she just said, make it simple. Like, so that other people, you know, everyone can understand. It's like, she said, if you throw someone like 10 balls, right, you can only catch maybe two. So it's like, if I say, okay, we, we are creating, I think it was during that, I think those few days, like we come up with the term Bloomberg for real estate, or we just say, you know, we help you save 90% of your time doing uh, real estate research. It's very simple, but before I was saying so many things before. Um, you know, when they would say, oh, can you introduce your business, um, you know, during the Betatron intro sessions, I think everyone was like two or three minutes and I'd still be talking after like 10 minutes or something <laughs> and they still don't really understand. So I think, I think it's just that messaging is like, you know, um, just make it simple and make sure you can get it across. I see. So actually, I want to ask really quickly, Tracy, so you know how like what Gary's saying that the Bloomberg of real estate, right? Does it have? Does it apply to most startups that they should think about how to connect that way, or you think it doesn't? It doesn't really applicable for all the startups. 
Hmm. It's a good question, and uh, it re reminds me of a few coaching sessions I had with my clients, um, uh, and a bunch of them were startups. And for some reasons, they like to say, "Hey, we are the Uber in you know Indonesia. We are the uh, a Trip dot com in whatever industry, or we are we are the uh, a Trafago or blah blah blah." Right. So, in fact, it's a it's a good side, or I would say upside or downside. Um, when you get, you know, for example, you just need to get the connections. When you just need that understanding with your audience, like Gary, hey, we are the Bloomberg uh, in real estate, perfect. And that is what I told Gary as well. You know, it's good because three words make a connection. That's great, but be careful. Analogy can only do that sort of instant click. When you want, you know, what you get, for example, when you want to tell investors or when you want to get clients. Then, then the analogy may not give you that token of success. Make sense? Why? Because once you get the connections, you still need to understand. You know, because the Uber in 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 uh, in, in airplane industry may not may not may not fit your purpose. So your mm -hmm. messaging needs to tie in with your purpose, your passion, your profession, and of course the problem. So I would say also the four Ps. Make sure you. You have a simple message, but that connects this four piece. So then people understand, you know, no matter what you are speaking to audience, clients, uh, investors, pitch, uh, you know, uh, the sort of, you know, judges or even your moms and dads, they can totally know why you're doing that. So not only you are telling a story about your statistics or your your business passion the why is super important right we always say the Simon Sinek that you always need to start with why because the why they can make a very long-term impact the analogy will give you certain leeway okay I understand what you do so then it's a conversation opener but it would not be a deal uh, maker makes sense if you're gonna make the deals you need to you know go through this simple message that hits the four piece specifically the problem that you're addressing to to make the people buy in so, so can you repeat one more time on the four piece i want to make sure i have my all, everything on my note you start from your passion specifically a startup correct you all have a startup passion to do that what you're doing and then will be your purpose why you're doing that you know you you're doing that of some purpose i guess correct mm -hmm. and then it will be your profession say for prop tech will be your um the uh the property industry combining the technology advancement right so this is your profession that is how you blend in your knowledge your stats and everything but this three piece doesn't go don't go anywhere if you don't address a problem so the fourth P will be your problem. I see. That's cool. And and fish, how do you feel so far? What Tracy has said so far, and then it's how do you like? How do you come by? Because I think uh, Gary and Amira are from data, and myself is you know like a like a research uh, platform. And yourself is like yeah, I'm sure you face directly talking to a landlord about it. How do you explain to the landlord, and how do yeah. you feel people will apply to you? So uh, I agree with uh, a lot of what Darren said. I mean, not Darren, uh, Gary said, meaning sometimes, sometimes you need to be in the right mindset. Um, as, a, as a founder, you're playing, you've got so many different caps that you're wearing and you're switching between all the time. Um, and sometimes you don't necessarily remember to take off. Like, so I'm also a, a technical person. I write a lot of our code. Um, and switching from that mindset where you're thinking in such a granular level and actually trying to execute on your vision for the next three to six months. You're selling them the vision or you're selling the dream, uh, which is like a whole different mindset. So I think one thing is to remember to keep switching that mindset. Um, another thing, which I think Tracy highlighted, which uh, again, as a product person, I'm so, I, I care a lot about, how these features are going to change and obviously we've thought we've developed these feature ideas because of the problems that our landlords um, have to handle all the time but when you speak to a landlord actually delivering the solution without amplifying the pain uh, ends up them fall like ends up it falling on deaf ears 
Uh, whereas when you highlight the problem that they're facing, instead of immediately remedying the situation, it sometimes works better to like get them more, more anxious or um, to relive those pain points. Because it hits so much harder. Uh, again, as a product person, I usually like to jump to the solution. Um, and it, it has required some training on my part. I don't think I'm very good at it yet. Um, but it is something that I'm trying to do more. It's like, instead of trying to remedy the situation with our, our solution that we've spent so much time developing, try to, with each landlord, even though you know exactly what they're saying, you have to reset to step zero and be like, okay, I'm going to listen to you from scratch, even though I probably know 95% of what you're going to tell me is your problems because I've talked to so many people already. So th being in that mindset and very uh, self-aware or very conscious of that state, I think um, takes practice, but I think it's, it's important to do. I see. So I was, uh, Tracy, so like what are, is there some any exercise that you think people in the pro protect professionals, uh, you know, can help and can do to practice? Is something that you can, you think that you can, uh, you think that someone like us to learn and for pitching? Um, you know what, prop tech guys are very, very professional and then they just, like, I met a lot of them are very, very good in their field, like, they just have, like, they, they're like a, you know, knowledge hub, all right? There's so many things inside the brain. Uh, my, my job is a communications coach or, you know, help them messaging to, to brand themselves. Uh, sometimes we use very simple exercise to get the message is like you're building your message house using there and your example saying you know it's a big mac right sometimes i also use big mac or mcdonald meals as a as a way to coach my clients remember you have your bread you have your hamburger you have your lettuce you have your uh, tomato you have your cheese all right if you want to upgrade you can make it a meal with chips and coke nice. then Using, you know, this and Gary's um, wording is like your mindset. Many times, startup like prop techs, they love to use different messages. They feel they need to speak different languages, different stories, different things when they speak with different people. But then that risk that they lost the focus, they lost the consistency. At the end of the day, suddenly you will forget what you said last week. Oh, when you're preparing something you need to say next week, you lost your focus this week. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So your simple exercise is you define what is the very core thing that you will never miss out. That will be your bread and your hamburger. All right. That means regardless where you are, who you meet, then you throw this piece so people can connect with you. All right. Then you have your tomatoes. They will be like your pitching elements. So you have your data, your stats, your finance, your team ready. Your letters could be, all right, this is where I, uh, I speak with my partners, how we can work, what is my model. And then when you hire, this will be your cheese. All right, hey, what is your growth? What is your mission? All right. And then when you need to upgrade it, you need to speak with a wide audience to make sales. Where can you bring in your, you know, French fries? Or sometimes when you make it a holistic pitch, you also add in your code. I hope that analogy makes sense to you. That means you build your message house. Although you will speak with different people in different, you know, occasions, but don't feel the need. You need to speak totally different language. It's still in, on, in front of you. You just grab whatever you want from the dish, from the plates of dish you prepared, not from different, you know, random elements. Then otherwise you will you know, what I call the called brand dilution. When you throw away different materials in different uh, space or different times, in different languages, you're diluting yourself. And then you lost the consistency. On that fridge, we say you need eight branding touch points to get a buy-in. The touch points, if you saw, for example, today you say, hey, I'm from uh, this company and I sell this, right? Tomorrow you say the totally different things to maybe a different audience, but in your messaging, you lost the focus and you are diluting yourself, then the branding touch points 
may be diluted. Imagine your audience today talk to you, tomorrow they go to your website, next week they go to your pitch deck. If different materials and different feelings and things they form about your brand, about your message, then you confuse your audience. So try to make sure, do some exercises like this back my exercise, get what you need in an elevator, in a big pitching uh, conferences, or in a, you know, a boardroom with a group of prospects. So then you can know what to get, get these things prepared. Um, when I work with coaches to prepare the pitches, many times, nearly all of them will struggle about uh, with anecdotes or comparisons okay specifically if you're in prop tech you need a bunch of industry data stats and comparisons updated in mm -hmm. your pocket before you go to you know your your meetings all right because these will be the meat to the bone that you can convince people not only by your own company information but by an industry trends and industry perspective as a whole. So people will buy you with more credibility and authority. I see. So, so it's just really fascinating because it is something that is, is easy said and done. And then it's just a lot of practice and- It is practice, it's a lot, yes. A lot of practice. I, I actually have more questions, but before that, um, Amira, Gary, and Fish, do you have any questions for Tracy? Uh, no, I was just going to say my problem is I always have the add-ons. <laughs> I had the chicken wings and everything else as well, <laughs> as, well as the meal. So yeah, I'm just... Uh... I, I had one question. Um, so I think one thing that I've experienced is that in an organization, usually, at least for my product, sometimes the decision maker is different than the people that actually use the product on a regular basis. Mm. So in, in my case, we help, uh, we help people streamline their operational flow, but it's not always the case that the landlord who focuses on the bigger picture actually deals with the day-to-day -day operations. Sometimes they just deal with the bigger picture and finding investment opportunities and stuff. Um, however, there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect because if you speak to the landlord, um, convincing them that there is a significant or lack of efficiency is not always easy to do because they don't actually experience it on a day-to-day -day basis um, whereas if you speak to the person that's actually suffering from the pain uh, they don't have the decision-making ability to actually make things happen um, it, is there a way to maybe I, I mean this is just something that I experienced and I was just wondering if you have any suggestions or uh, thoughts? Sure, thanks. Uh, shall I, you know, reply directly, Darren? Yeah, sure, go for it. Sure. Okay, first of all, it's a very common, I would say, challenge, uh, specifically B2B owners, B2B businesses would face, because you feel that what you are selling is for the end users, right? But there is a big decision maker in between that you need a buy-in from them and they yeah. have a very different set of um, problems in the head. They care about different things. Then, then of course, you, you need yeah. to first of all know the, the objective of that conversations. Um, but before going so, mm -hmm. you need to find the connections between the middle party, like your landlord versus the, is that, who, who are the end users for your case? Um, for example, their staff, Maybe their assistants, um, yeah, people that they hire, perhaps, that are using the software. And can you see the connections between the landlord and these users, like staffs and stuff? Sorry, what do you mean? Any connections between the, um, the middleman or the, the second step versus the end user? So, I... I mean, I believe that there are connections because I... Like, I personally believe that the inefficiencies of the staff lead to additional costs for the landlord. Um, inefficiencies of the staff maybe lead to slower, um, slower developments of certain action items that need to be completed. Yeah. But I guess the landlord doesn't necessarily relate to that as well. Um, mm. Unless I can tell them, like, 
you will save, you can fire this many people or you can uh, rent out your property this much faster or something like that. Like something so vividly clear, which to be honest, there's no guarantee because each organization is actually very, very different. Mm. Um, it's, and sometimes people that are so old school, they'll like hold you to your word, exactly whatever you say. So it's yeah. like, you don't want to, you don't want to ever convey the wrong message. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, how do you create a clear picture for them to be mm. able to actually simplify? Like, I'll give you one example. I've spoken to some landlords and they've, I've told them that we can reduce the time spent on these things. And their actual answer was, it's, it's their work to do. I don't need it. I'm, I'm paying them a salary. Why should I save them time? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a, a different mindset, right? Yeah. And so remember the four piece I mentioned just now, right? Yeah. Can I make an assumption that you, when you speak to the landlord, they are the only group in the room. That means you will, because for example, if you are speaking to a room with both landlord and the staffs, that would be an issue because then, yeah. then you, then you can't close the deal at all. All right, yeah. and just yeah. emotionally influence them, but you may yeah. not want to close that because if they have a very big different sort of objectives, yeah. And the problem still is the hitting point. I will always say that you inspire with your passion and purpose, you inform them with your product information, but then you influence them with the problems, right? The problem is the crucial thing, so the your burger. Then you have your, using okay. my backpack analogy, you build a set of, you know, tomatoes. That is an example why the staff need to use it. You build a set of your cheese, another example why the landlord would appreciate that. But when you speak to the landlord, forget about tomatoes, focus on your cheese, okay? Then you bring them a cheeseburger. Then why the landlord would need that? They don't really care about, you know, the staff or the end user's problem because, you know what? everybody it's kind of selfish in this economy yeah, exactly. right then if you need to make a sales if you want to close a deal you need to select and don't feel bad you need to forgive or give up the set of tomatoes this time because yeah. your target is the landlord then you bring a cheese to them then they will say okay you understand me the connections and then the understanding is very important if you keep repeating the problems that are not in their shoes then they was like okay but why why me then why don't you go to speak with the users all right but then if you want to make it more structured then your presentation you can make a connections to it um i can make it you know for example um last year i coach a team that have health tech they're producing some elderly sticks and uh, they are selling to a bunch of both B2B and B2C businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, B2B meaning they're selling to the elderly centers. They hope that they will use this uh, smart sticks, all right? And they also sell to homeowners, but the homeowners or the consumers, not the elderly, the 70 or 80s they're selling to or talking to, right? They're talking to the sons or the whoever care givers that take care exactly. of the elderly, all right? So the problem is very different. The problem of the end users actually it's just to have a stick to support them mm. but the selling the message the stories for the sons and daughters is the emotional connections with the person they're buying for hey why you care about your dad what if they fall on the ground and you are not there so you present a lot of you know emotional problems for them but then another set of messages goes to the elderly santa we are not creating a different set of message, we just add another layer. Okay, do you want to have your sentence, for example, to be seen as uh, caring and uh, you being seen as more you know, innovative or some companies want to position as a high price uh, elderly center selling to middle class, right? Then you say, you know what? This will be your differentiator, differentiator because the, the, we are not telling the different stories, all right? Because the, the son and the daughters, when they come and visit the moms and dads, they want to see that you're going extra step. You're introducing new things for the moms and dads. So we are not, I hope this example gives you a sense, which is a real example that we are not generating a very different stories. We're generating one set of stories, but in different layers. And then you put different key message in 
your burger when you speak with different target audience. At the end of the day, in this case, my client never spoke to the end users, okay? Because they are the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But yeah. they spoke to the, uh, the, 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 the middle person, the, the moms, and, the sons and daughters, or the elderly centers in a B2B and B2C messaging. So I hope that relates to you. No matter who you speak to, go with the problem first because that is what they care about. Sounds okay. good. That's a, that's a really good question, by the way. That's really good because, like, I think a lot of people can relate to that. Like, sometimes I talk to associate level, senior level, and C suits. They have different things that they worry about. So I think that was a really good question. Thanks for asking. And Amira, yourself, like, do you have any questions for Tracy? That you, that um, I guess for me, it would be in a, a standpoint of you know, again, uh, property in tourism. Um, you know, right now we're seeing huge retrenchments. Right, we've seen like British Airways retrenching about 36,000 staff. We're seeing a lot of people lose their jobs. So my question is, how can they leverage uh, personal branding and how they would be able to look for, you know, opportunities in the sectors that they're looking for and in their profession, you know, in, namely that they might not be able to go into tourism again, but they might be going to somewhere similar. But how would they be able to leverage their personal branding having been in that area for quite some time? Mm, all right. So thank you, Mara. Um, it's a very common, commonly asked question when we work with company of uh, people on the brand. First of all, I, I want to say that the core concepts of company branding and personal branding are more or less the same, right? We create the perception that you want others to feel about too, no matter you are a brand, I mean, your company, your product or your personality. Okay. So when you work, when I work with people on the brand, the very first thing is we have an understanding on the personality. Okay. Then, uh, for example, what are your key strengths? And I am a believer of strengths can be highly leverageable. You may have experience in tourism, in hotel, or in logistics that related to, uh, you know, tourism or tag and stuff like that. And when you want to change that, many times people defeat themselves here because they feel, oh my God, I, I, I'm always used to be, you know, uh, a hotel staff and I don't know how to change, all right? But don't worry, personalities, and this is the different element I add into the four piece. When you work with people, personal branding, we add in the personality. Then we branch it with the purpose and the passion. Because based on the personality, when you speak of your passion, for example, if you are in the hotel or in, in the airline industry, how you serve your customers, totally leverageable to many different industries. Even if you're a customer service and you train yourself to add in knowledge and professional qualities, qualifications, uh, like you, you become a data scientist, then how can you transform your brand, all right? It goes back to your purpose and your passion. Say, combining your customer servicing experience and your knowledge in data science or data analytical skills, what problems you want to solve. So try to think about, do not feel that you got stuck in your box, all right? Find something overlapping. And I always say you need to use the word reverse engineering. Think about your future boss. What do they want? Normally, there will be like five areas. Most of them want growth, all right? Some of them want quality, quality of service, quality of uh, product. Some of them need efficiency. Like, okay, I want the less resources doing the most things. Okay, some of them need a people leader that they need people to, to, to get things done. Or they, so they want a man, people manager. The last one could be um, transformation. That means uh, we have a lot of change or projects. How can you, you know, manage that? So a few big objectives the future employers may have. Think from their perspective and work backwards on your existing strengths, put it back to your passion, tell your story, and what skills you can leverage. Then you can build a very, very much, uh, I would say, applicable brand in the future jobs. So it would be good to have a clear target, what sort of jobs you are going for, and then understand yourself, then you can tell a story. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. 
And actually, to me too, I actually have a question that I'm thinking because uh, I've tried a lot about social media or online marketing and the brand to tell people the story. And I found it very difficult for my own company too. So I'm actually thinking that like, is there, is there any tips for how like, public, like startups or professionals or you know, people want to get into this field to think about when they, when they express themselves online? Is there any tips or you, in your point of view is more or less the same? offline or online? Hmm. Um, you know, uh, I have some clients, uh, they, or I have even some contacts, they like following those high sales coaches or, you know, the, the successful people online and then they just copy whatever steps they have, right? I call those tactics, okay? Your mm -hmm. Tactics are easy to be copied. But then uh, some, one, one thing that can't be copied, it's, it's yourself, okay? And that is why, why personal branding helped is that you need to add in your own personal elements to be authentic. There are a lot of, you know, steps, you know, how can you make your SEO success, how to write your keywords, how to, you know, get your, 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 your website on a higher Google ranking. Then it's a lot of tactics. You can, you can find ways and steps to do that. But then when you want to stand out, I would go back to your message. Even for example, um, sometimes why uh, I have a partners, they, they do Facebook marketing, okay? The Facebook marketing strategy, actually, it's very easy. I can tell you they have a bunch of, uh, we call it young kids, right? They are in schools, but then they can keep changing, you know, your targets, your, your geographies, your demos to, to, to hit the target. But how they can hit the target, and they told me the key challenge is that many customers go to them without a message. Oh. And... But they are only doing marketing, like like, like like media buying, right? They just do Facebook marketing for you. They, ne they will not design your message for you. And many times when I work with this partner, we see there's a huge gap on people didn't think about their messaging. They just say, hey, I want to, you know, I want to be seen on Facebook. I want to be seen on Google. Help me out. But then, hey, then what is your message? Okay. Do you have a brand, a consistent brand, essentially the officials? not only the message, but a clear image. So your message and image hands in hand together. For personal branding, you need your face, but for company branding, do you have you know, strong visuals to connect with your message? Then, then you bring in your tactics, Facebook, social, um, social media marketing, LinkedIn, Google. These are all the tactics and people who can hack those, we call it, you know, uh, sales hacking or social media hacking, marketing hacking, they can, you know, do a lot of tactics for you. But then before you go to them, the question is, have you got a clear message and powerful image in place? I see. It sounds like it it's really comes back to the why. And yeah. then my takeaway at the moment is that even in anywhere to touch point, doesn't matter if it's going to be online or offline, you got to express the why because if the why is there it will take it will take you know take care of everything else so so that's, that's, that's something that like even it's really good to like remind myself to think about that kind of stuff and then i think i think i think it's pretty good i, I think uh actually i got a lot of notes on these these highlights is there something that uh, is there any more tips that you feel that people like prop tech or real estate sector should know more because you know it seems like we are a sector that are I think as a whole, unlike entertainment or F&B, maybe, maybe I'm biased, but I don't think we're that good at expressing and then doing a good, like, authentic marketing. Is there something, or even, even just the message itself, is there something that you, you think that, like, as an industry, we should think about more? Like, what's, what's something that you, you, you want to, like, you know, think that, like, you know, as an industry, if we can do X, Y, Z, it would be a lot better? I would say um, uh, sometimes... I feel just a feeling, all right? Many yeah. practitioners in industry um, do not understand what the importance and or the, the magic of property itself. Property is like, you know, talking about weather in the world. It's universal. When you talk about property, everyone raises their eyebrows, correct? Because mm -hmm. it's an essential for them. Why whenever, you know, the market is good or the market is down, the analysts will talk about gold because it's a very distinctive positioning among investors. So think about property is distinctive and unique. And you can think about as asset class, you can think about as a 
investment tool. You can think about as a you know office space, premises, or as a tool for you to you know get future income, or or at least it's a shelter for you. Correct. So property essentially is of demand every single country in the world. And that makes the content creation for PropTech so interesting, all right? I can't speak for you know, any of the, um, of the companies focus because of wide range, but think about global economy. Why, when I've studied journalism, just to share an example, one of the professors, and then later one of my clients told me, financial journalism will never die because it is the pillar of the economy. All right. You can forget about, you know, literature. You can forget about investigative journalism. You can even don't need to know what is happening in front of your door, but you always need to read about what's happening in your country, in your region, and far, far, far away in other continents because property is so connected and mm. one thing leads to another. So I would say if you want to um, make your content make your marketing make your messaging more convincing more colorful do not forget the unique positioning of property how one thing leads to another and it, it is always that i see that's really good I, I feel like we can talk about this for like entire night or something, like entire like couple hours straight but then before i before we end this call i think just a couple more things i want to ask you and then everyone else um, so actually, so, so, you know, Gary, Fish and, uh, Amir, like what's the takeaway from this call so far? How do you feel about it? Um, for myself, I think, um, actually I've got one more question for Tracy. Um, I guess yes. it's like, uh, the takeaway I want to get, I, because, you know, at the early stage of startups, you know, our resources are so limited, the time, our money, blah, 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 we're always complaining about these things. But you know, we're trying to build both our, you know, our company, our branding. So is it like, from what I'm getting is like at the early days, is that we need to focus on ourselves as, as being the personal brand, as being the face of the brand. Um, you know, is that something you would agree with, or is that something what you view as well? Uh, because in the early days, yeah, we have a logo, we have a company website, etc. But it kind of means nothing, right? Because only you can just create that in like ten minutes. Also, but then yeah. to actually create a connection with your potential clients, getting exposure, you know, getting people to know about your your company, you know, is this something we should focus on, you know, by personal branding at the start? Is that is that right? I would totally agree, and I, I my 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 agreement is supported by a finding by a U.S. Um, uh, uh, VC blogs. When I, which I read and found a research result. So 99%, like nearly all people who invest in startups in a series A or before stage, they, re, they vote for you not because of your logo, not because of you know, um, your team, mainly it's because of you. So then the credibility of founders is super important in, you know, from an infant startup to it, like at least, at least it goes to like the series A. And then when it, when it goes to uh, series B or, you know, later, then it depends on, on the growth and the numbers. But before that, because everything is a future tense for startup, right? We are selling a vision. We are talking about something in the future. Then the question, the basic question goes to, okay, I like the vision, but who is going to execute it? Who will bring my vision to life? It's you. So then your message, your image, your personal brand is so important in the narrow stage. Mm. Okay. Thanks. Amira, do you have any, uh, what's the takeaway that you got from this so far? Yeah, for me, I think it's just really interesting. You know, you, you sometimes have a thought that you think that, you know, these are the things that I'm doing wrong inherently. When you speak to someone, you always have that, you know, moment, oh, why did I say that? You know, or I could have said it better. And you go over that, you know, that that thought, like when you're, go, you're in your shower, so you're always thinking like, did I really have that conversation? I should have had it another way. And I think like, you know, uh, hearing from Tracy as well, you solidify that. And also you think more about how you can send your messaging out. And I remember, you know, there was once when I was, um, you know, it's a long time ago when I was at university and there was actually this guy, he owns the Ministry of Cake and he was serving good cake, um, you know, uh, that was their mission statement. 
and um, basically everyone bought it. And uh, if uh, you know, until today, they actually serve um, cake to every single one of the coffee chains in the UK. So I think personal branding and messaging is really important. And I, and I think Tracy brought about really important points that I think we overlook. And sometimes we just knew, know instinctively, but we don't know how to leverage it. And I think Tracy has really taught us how we can actually use different tools to improve in our communication and our branding as well. Cool. So thank well, you, Tracy. Thank you. Oh, well, Fish yourself, like, how do you feel about it? Um, yeah, thanks, Tracy, for uh, sharing your wisdom. Um, I think one of the big takeaways that I had was uh, the importance of consistency. Um, and I mean, the way you're saying it is uh, you have a burger and you've got all these different elements. Um, effectively, you, you might not be serving the same burger to everybody, but the ingredients are the same. So to some extent, it's, it's somewhat formulaic. And the, fo the focus in the beginning should just be deciding all the components that, or all the ingredients that are necessary and be so comfortable and be so, um, like you should be able to say each of those components on demand whenever need be, whether you're in a, uh, the right frame of mind or not, um, because you're so comfortable with it. And then deciding which ingredients to provide to someone is just based off who you're speaking to. So, um, it, it, it can be formulaic and as long as you practice it sufficiently that you know all the ingredients very well, um, you can still deliver a message to each person just by including different ingredients as opposed to for each person starting from scratch and deciding what, what needs to be done. Um, I think having that consistency is something that um, I think was a big thing, of, uh, a takeaway for me. So Tracy, um, just wondering, so in the future for if, if we want to find out and reach out to you and find out more, more about your work, uh, where should we go? Is there like a, uh, like a page? Do you have like a website that like people should reach out to you through? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have our business site, but if you want to find me myself, then uh, I think LinkedIn, Facebook and WhatsApp are the, you know, key channels. Uh, so WhatsApp, it's always easier for quick advice. advice. And then uh, LinkedIn, because LinkedIn, I have my own personal insights, uh, my blogs, uh, but similar, you know, it will be also on the website. And uh, we also have a booking site for consultation. But again, everything could be linked through LinkedIn and Facebook. So it's always easier because I, I, I sometimes tell people, hey, go to the site, right? But then they're like, oh, what is your website? But you remember my name, Tracy Ho, personal branding. Then LinkedIn will help you find me out. That's great. And actually, before I go, right, I'm actually curious too. Um, like, for someone else who watched this and want to learn more about different people and different material, what are the things that you would direct people to go? Is there some, uh, someone, that, someone else you know or someone, uh, books or articles that you think people should read into and look into? Oh, wow, it's a big question. Um, for me, like, I always suggest, uh, in a coaching perspective, I always suggest clients uh, do not 100% follow what I say or what you say, right? Because our learning model is different. When I learn about coaching, then you first need to understand your own learning model. Say for me, my learning model is from people consultation. Mm -hmm. So I must talk to people to get things known and stuck in my mind. But someone get information from books, someone can get a lot of information from vlogs, right, videos. Mm -hmm. Then, so first of all, I would suggest people to understand what is the best way for you to learn. Say for me, I have um, a sort of, you know, a, 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 a advisor group, then I know, okay, who to call. So that is my first go-to advice. Mm -hmm. but then my second tier is books. Um, that sometimes I read books or the gist of it to get the ideas and then I would do mm -hmm. further researches. I see. It, it, it's like we, we also have like a very similar thing. Uh, I set up this whole uh, density prop tech meetup group. And then mm -hmm. for me, it's like, it's a really good community because same thing, same as similar to you, that whenever I need questions about real estate in Hong Kong or the world, I, I rely on that group. And Gary and Fish are also in the group. And sometimes, a lot of times they open bar and say, hey, what's going on? And that is actually really helpful to have a, a, a group of people that you trust and know their, their domain. That, that's really good. 
And then actually, I was curious too, right? Which also go to uh, Amara and yourself, Tracy. Uh, who are someone that you think we should understand, learn more? It doesn't have to be branding. It can be hmm. something related to real estate or something that like prop tech founders or enthusiasts can learn from. Is there anyone in mind that you can think of? Uh... Because, they, because sometimes uh, there are also local uh, different regions and different markets needs. But I would say, but, you know, for because you, you guys are doing, you know, tech, I also, you know, think about uh, if you can learn from some data analysts or SEO specialists. Sometimes mm -hmm. uh, I'm not. I'm not a specialist in this. I, I work with my partners um, in, in, that in that area. But then uh, from my messages, right? So after your brand, after your branding procedures, after your branding journey, then what sort of keywords, what sort of you know, strategies that can you know, get you higher ranked? Then um, my experience is that SEO is, a, is still a you know, steep learning curve for many people. Very so true. SEO specialist will be good. I see. And, and, and Amara, uh, 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 is there someone that you think or some, some topic that we, you think we should cover in the future? Um, yeah, so I actually feel like, you know, every single one of the subjects are very interconnected and especially with technology coming into the picture and being a huge disruptor in a lot of markets as well, everything sort of becomes intertwined. So for me, it's more so that I like taking online courses like on Coursera or EDX and, you know, learning more about different things. Like I don't come from a typical financial background, but I'm learning uh, currently on Coursera, I'm learning um, financial markets. And, um, you know, I don't come from a um, background you know, doing digital marketing, but I'm actually doing Google certification right now. So oh. I do think it's really important for you to learn more about different sectors because it gives you a better understanding when you're talking to different people as well. Because, you know, like when we go to different events as well, or conferences, you know, sometimes you're not only with people from the prop tech sector, sector, you're from people from different sectors and, you know, even speaking to VCs as well. Like uh, when I went to the Facebook Accelerator program, and, uh, you know, speaking to them, you know, they have completely different personal interests. And I think when you understand these different subjects, you can speak to them better. And, you know, sometimes it's just that first impression. And then, you know, speaking to them a lot more, you open doors to a lot more places. So I would say, like, try to learn more about different subjects that are not completely re relevant to you. Like, I don't have a pricing group that I can you know, go and speak to because pricing is not something that people take very seriously, although they do have to, because it does, you know, uh, at the end, it influence the bottom line of your, you know, cash flow, profit and loss uh, statements, right? But again, you know, it's something that I think that regardless, I can learn from LinkedIn, there are so many groups that do that as well. So trying to find out more about that would be great, I think. No, I'll be cool. I'll be cool. I think that even for us, right, like, um, Myself, I'm, I'm, I try to read into SEO is so tricky. And then, but however, is that similar to you, like when I talk to different industry, they learn they, some industry, for example, like uh, my friend from NMB, and they talk a lot about SEO and everything. They're like, oh, I never know you know that. And then I can apply to my own business too. So I think what you said resonate me a lot too. It's something that I believe in is that your scope should be broadened. And then obviously it's really important to focus on your work and your, your sector, but then you cannot shut all the doors and then just be your a little black box. You got to reach out and all different stuff and you never know something that you learn from a different industry can apply to yours. And then, yeah. uh, the, the, so thanks a lot for your time because like it's, I do learn a lot. And then even I think that a lot, a lot of people, if, if they watch this together, I think they learn a lot. I'm just curious, are you guys okay with us to post online to share with everyone? If, if you don't mind. Yeah, sure. Oh, I think Michelle has something to say as well. Yeah, I, sorry, I had one a question that suddenly came to mind um, for Tracy, uh, if we still have some time. Yeah, yeah, um, we do. Oh, sure. So, yes, yeah, so it's a quick question. So, for example, with stuff like SEO or when you're putting out content online or you're updating your website, um, usually if you get a lot of leads or you have a lot of traffic, uh, it enables you to A-B test your messaging. Maybe like make the call to action really big versus making it really small. You can actually measure the impact of the way you're delivering your message. Um, mm -hmm. With the context of maybe your elevator pitch or something, maybe you're not like um, 
there a good way to maybe A-B test or establish what are the lines to actually be using? Uh, I'll give you one example just to maybe put it into context. Um, for example, I can say we help landlords reduce costs mm. or I can say we help landlords increase their net profit or um, so- something like that where there are different messages that you're saying um, and even though they might mean the same yeah. thing, um, is there a way for us to maybe test efficiently which way we should actually go about uh, phrasing what we do? Okay, uh, Vishal, there, there was a little of a delay so then i couldn't you know hear so this message is used in pitching or in is used in marketing um like online marketing or, or or live pitching so i would say live pitching um okay. in terms of online marketing i'm guessing like the best way that how to do it is obviously generate a lot of traffic and then a b test um because you can actually measure your click through rates and all of that sort of stuff yeah. whereas when you're doing in-person sales or in-person uh, cold calls or anything that is not digital, maybe the ways of measuring which messaging is better is a, is a lot tougher. So um, what I was wondering is like, I, did you hear that example that I gave? Yeah, with the, uh, the increased cost or, uh, or increased revenue, right? So this would be in like a more personalized way of delivering the messaging. Uh, because you don't necessarily have a way to measure it firstly and maybe you don't you're not scalably talking to that many people so you don't know um, if you have enough volume to actually justify like if you speak to two people and one person likes one better than the other it's like it doesn't really justify um, what path you should go down you know uh, okay if sometimes in a messaging exercise, I would work with clients if time allows to go for a, a survey or a focus group, because uh, you know if you have, which is very helpful because uh, for example, I assume you have a bunch of clients or potential clients or friends that in the industry that know what to do, correct? Then running a very specific focus group questions, even like hey, if I ask you, you like minimizing your cost or maximizing your profits which one you like then you just get and don't complicate things right when you but when you go to this focus group stage you have a sim you know you have, you have your burger in shape already you just want to know what sort of you know sequence um, yeah. or flavor to add correct so only go for that stage if you have something very specific in mind for example hey i'm going to pitch what message will be more powerful or sometimes because remember property is always economy related then um to be honest in a general environment maximizing profit is always uh of demand than minimizing cost because people are more or less on the greedy side right but at the same time at this moment we have a global downturn coming up properly the minimizing costs resonate more so then so then your focus group needs to be done very close to the date of your launch of your pitch and don't do that in a very early stage if you want to test this sort of message and test it with real person if you can otherwise uh, use your own judgment judgment comes from maybe your peers your staff uh, even your sales people would be the best best source to to get to hey what's the sentiment now all right P- are people spending money or are people cutting costs? If the sentiment is of the cost cutting yeah. space, then of course you go for the minimizing cost. Otherwise, in yeah. general, in sales pitching, we go for maximizing profit. Mm. But just to, you know, just to give you an answer. Okay. That's really good. I think that's a good way to to conclude our call. And then uh, I just want to let you know, uh, next time we're actually trying to find a couple uh, real estate professional, traditional professional talk about the industry pain points so if it's interested I can, we can send you a link uh, after we film next time and then uh, I think this is a great way to end and thanks so much for you guys to come in and then obviously for sure I have a lot actually I have a lot more questions in my mind and I'd like to ask you personally and then thanks for joining us and then hopefully there's next time coming up very soon thank you FME yeah, thank thanks you. cheers no, thank thanks you. Thanks, man. have a good day bye, bye. have a good day